Welcome back to the Morning Show here on the Rise News. I am Adesua Moran. And I'm Rufayo saying it's you again. That's <laughs> it. So I can't say that enough. As the African Continental Free Trade Agreement begins, a lot of industry watchers are waiting with bated breath for Nigeria's reaction. Mm -hmm. AFCTA is said to be the largest free trade zone in the world. And it's bringing a lot of trading potential. But the question is, does Nigeria have what it takes to harness them? You know, we're still talking about issues of dumping of products and things like that. Joining us to discuss this and more is Dr. Andrew Nevin, advisory partner of PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, great to have you here, Andrew Nevin. Great to be here. Good morning. Good, Andrew. It's a pleasure having you. <laughs> Let's go straight to it, Andrew. This started last year, Rwanda 2018 AFCTA. Can you talk us through the potential of this and how mammoth this market is going to be when it finally kicks on? It's going to be fully operational in July, although it started yesterday. Can you talk us through that? Well, I, I think Africa, I mean, we're heading to 2 billion people, right? And the courage of the African Union and President Kagame from, uh, from Rwanda to kind of drive this forward, and the fact that everyone is coming along, almost everyone, we're not quite yet, but coming along with them shows people understand for Africa to be prosperous, we need to trade and invest with Africans. And if you, you think about the way the continent is divided up, we have a colonial legacy in West Africa. We deal with it every day with French, English, Portuguese, uh, unnatural borders. If we actually go to the pre-colonial period, there was a very uh, massive trade of investment flows that were not tied to what, what are now nation states. So in a sense, we're trying to return back to that in a modern era. Um, but at the end of the day, if we have 2 billion uh, Africans and populations are shrinking in the rest of the world, the only way to be prosperous is to produce higher value-added goods and services in Africa, and the only people that are going to buy them are largely Africans. So we need this to be prosperous. Well, it's no longer news that African countries don't trade enough with each mm. other. It's about 16, 17 percent mega uh, mm. compared to how they trade with uh, other uh, countries on the, on the, on the globe. Uh, beg your pardon there. But Nigeria hasn't yet signed to this agreement. What is the impact of Nigeria not being a part of the AFTA? Okay, let me come to the Nigeria not being part. But let me go back to that, that figure that's often cited, 16 to, 70, 16 to 17 percent of our trade is intra-Africa trade, mm -hmm. which is lower than Europe or lower than intra-Asia trade. Mm -hmm. The problem with that number is actually, I think at least 60 percent of our trade is informal. Uh, and I don't want to call it illegal. It's not illegal, but it's not captured in the formal statistics. So if you look at the, uh, in West Africa, the formal statistics for our intra-West Africa trade, they look tiny. But there's actually lots of things going on. And of course, some of that's trading from imported goods from elsewhere that's making its way from coastal countries like Nigeria to Ivory Coast to the hinterlands. But actually, it turns out that the informal trade has a higher percentage of manufacturing content uh, from within Africa than the formal trade does. So uh, the, um, the issue is not just uh, how small our trade is, but how to bring the informal trade more into the formal system. And of course, we have lots of barriers. People don't want to move from the informal system to the formal system because it has costs. It has to have benefits, but the benefits are not perceived as big enough. So that's an issue for Africa. In terms of Nigeria being part of it, I think sometimes here we say because we're 200 million people and we're going to 400 million people, um, that uh, we think that somehow this won't happen if we don't join up. I think the reality is Africa is just moving on. I mean, even within West Africa, you look at the, the uh, rebound of Ivory Coast. So Ivory Coast had a civil war. The AFDB had to decamp from Abidjan up to Tunis for a number of years. They, they moved back, I think, three years ago now. They've rebuilt their headquarters. And what they're doing in Ivory Coast, I mean, their headline uh, growth numbers are good. Six percent, six, seven percent. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're very good. But also what's happening is you're starting to get very good integration in this Francophone West Africa. You know, um, people may not realize this. Mali, Burkina Faso, they're not just physically big countries. They actually have quite large populations, right? Um, Senegal's not physically contiguous. But the Francophone Africa, they are integrating. So people are going to integrate around us. And Ghana, you know, they may say, well, let's just more integrate with the Francophone West Africa economy. And they're big enough. They'll be bigger than us in population, I think, together uh, on that. So I, Africa will move on without Nigeria. So it's hard for me to see why Nigeria is not. On, on, on the why, uh, when you look at some of the reasons given by the government, don't you think they are legitimate or not? Because being the biggest market on the continent, we do have a lot to either gain or to lose. So some of those uh, concerns raised are, uh, we, we're not so industrialized like other 
countries on the continent. It will be a dumping ground. Uh, the Manufacturing Association of Nigeria has raised concern. The yeah. NLC has also raised concerns. Don't you think there's a legitimate concerns to hold off? Yeah, no, I, well, I think, I think it's right to ask the questions about it. And MAN and NL NLC are asking the questions. The presidency, the, the federal government's considering the issues. I, I think the problem is that um, we need a manufacturing sector that's 10 to 15 times bigger in Nigeria than we have today to be prosperous. So it's not today's manufacturers that should be our focus. Our question is, how do we create the environment where we have, have these other, uh, the, you know, the, the, the 10 to 15 times? So new manufacturers, existing manufacturers expanding dramatically. Um, uh, and the, the issue of the dumping ground, the problem is that our costs are not competitive. I'm not talking if, like with Ghana or with Ivory Coast. So the question we should be asking ourselves is not, let's put up walls because of that. It's, why are our costs not competitive? And now we all understand the reasons for it. Infrastructure, inability to solve the power problem, port congestion. So why don't we address those fundamentals? And then we are still the biggest market. And you know, this morning I, I saw an article about this. And I mean, there should be no reason Ogun can't produce at a lower cost to deliver into northern Nigeria than Ghana and Ivory Coast. I mean, it, it, because the, we're right here. We've got everything to manu manufacture it at. But we haven't solved the fundamental problem. So then we stay out of the AF, uh, CFTA, and we don't get to the fundamental issues. And, of course, you had the earlier guest, Dr. Mule from, from the CBN, talking about exports. Mm. I mean, we've just had the announcement a few weeks ago, I think a week ago, the FG would clear a papa. Well, why are people not exporting? Well, one, people, one reason people are not exporting is they can't get through the port. So why did it take the federal government four years, the, the administration, to address that issue? If it was clearable in a week, they could have done it four years ago. So let, let, let's talk about this. Access is why the ACFTA was brought about access. And when you hear, you know, the dynamics being put up by some business people and business leaders out there, you're shocked. Take, for instance, we all saw the famous quote by richest African, Aliko Dangote, saying, I cannot, it, it takes me a lot to move my cement into Benin Republic. But Benin Republic will easier bring in cement from China. So there are a lot of taxes and tariff for me selling my cement in Benin Republic but it's easier and cheaper to bring in cement from China to Benin Republic and sell. So obviously I'm outdone in the market. Right, but this is the whole point. I think sometimes people miss the point of something or a big point of AFCFTA. It's to present a common front outside. So if we're all in the AFCFTA together, the rules for Chinese cement coming into, into Africa are set by Africa. Right? It's not set by one individual country, so we would no longer have this problem. The rules for consumer goods coming from Europe are set by Africa. So our ability to uh, create our own markets is much bigger than what we have today, where individual countries or blocks set it up. Now, then people come and say, well, yeah, but you know, people are going to dump things in uh, illegally. Well, the issue that we say with that is that's absolutely a consideration. The vice president raised it. We need to know the provenance of goods. But you know, the way we think that should be attacked is more with these technologies, right? So if you think about something like blockchain, which we've talked a lot about and is happening in Nigeria, one of the use cases of blockchain is to trace through goods services, through, yeah. through the system, right? So then you know if the, China came, if the cement came from, from China. Uh, so it can't come into Benin with no, with no tariff. So I don't think the solution is for us to put up our walls. It's to have a better view of the supply chain and make sure that African goods yeah. can trade freely and other goods can't. But if you look at the EU, like why is it such a disaster for the UK to go out of the EU? Because right now they sell goods and services friction-free into Europe. When they go out of it, Europe has a, a barrier for people not in part of the EU, and it's mm. enforced. Well, when you look at the dynamics of the market, here are two the pre-existing trade agreement amongst blocks. So take, for instance, ECOWAS. There used to be a trade agreement between open borders across ECOWAS countries. Uh, the same is in, in Eastern Africa. It's called EGAD. Uh, the static in Southern Africa and things like that. So obviously with the AFCTA, nullify all of that because you have those blocks. But the question and the factor has always been that these countries in those blocks didn't use these trading platforms enough, like ECOWAS. We didn't trade enough across the African belt, the Western African belt. So will AFCTA come and nullify all of this or we're still going to have all of this in place? Well, we'll see how it works structurally. And I absolutely agree with you that in ECOWAS, we did not take enough advantage of uh, or, or push the reforms enough. And I think there wasn't the political will.
but you know, maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, my sense is the lack of political will was, to a large extent, Nigeria not having the political will to make ECOWAS work. As I said, Francophone Africa is integrating. And in the East, if you take Uganda, Rwanda, uh, Kenya, somewhat Tanzania together, I mean, they have made a lot of progress on economic integration. So yeah, I see AFCFTA as also being a push for all, to make sure that we are at, at regional level and then continental level kind of integrating. Um, but yeah, we're losing right now in West Africa because we haven't taken advantage of the integration that countries promised each other already. Well, you know, interestingly, you mentioned the UK and the EU Brexit saga initially. Uh, you're so optimistic about this pan-African economy, but even the EU it took it 50 years and they had far less barriers. So why are you so optimistic that this would work for Africa? And that's one. Uh, also, when you look at the trade partners with Africa, the Chinas of this world, the, the U.S., you see the large appetite of African countries for loans from these countries. And now you want to do trade, excluding them? How well, will that work? Let me go back. I'm not sure I'm optimistic. I think I, the way I would express it is that it's a necessity. I mean, it is mathematically guaranteed if we have 2 billion people and we're exporting uh, raw materials, we will be poor, right? It's just because raw materials only represents 5 to 10 percent of the value of finished goods. So that's a fact. So if we do not trade with Africans and invest with Af within Africa, we will be poor. So at least if we try this, we have some positive probability that we will be uh, more prosperous. But I think you know, what we've said before is Africa, if, we, if we've suffered because of the colonial cut-up of the continent, this is a chance to come out as one block. So then that block, it needs to have economic relations with China. It needs to have economic relations with India. It needs to have economic relations with the EU. It needs to have economic relations with the U.S. But the point of having a bigger block is you know, we have a voice. I mean, people listen to the EU. People want to trade with the EU. It has, it's the lar largest economy. If we have 2 billion people, we'll be the largest block. And if, even if we have quite low income, the total of, uh, spending here is big. So people will, will listen to us and will negotiate with us. But uh, as I said, there's no guarantee it's going to work. I'm not necessarily an optimist. Okay. But, I, but I am guaranteed that if we don't try something like this, we, we, we will we'll be poor. Know. All right, Andrew, there are some arguments, um, arguments and things like dumping. And I'm going to bring that issue to the fore again. And we know that countries of various nations, I mean, superpowers, subsidize their products. So take, for instance, soya beans is heavily subsidized in America. And that's why you see America can have interactions into the Chinese economy, supplying a lot of soya beans to China. In fact, uh, the relationship between the likes of Xi Jinping and America come a long way with the soya bean export. Uh, but what if foreign nations start to say, OK, our goods and products have been subsidized. So since AFCT has started, we might not want to come to the Nigerian market, but what do we do? We look at Ghana, for instance. We dump our goods in Ghana. It's a common market agreement. We dump our goods in Ghana. And from Ghana, we all know that the borders well, are very a, porous. A, and they come into Nigeria. So dumping still comes no, in. No, but it's still what you've just described is a crime, right? I mean, we've got AFCTA. We've got a common tariff uh, regime to outside groups. If someone comes in and dumps it without paying the tariff, they paid the crime. If they have paid the tariff, then it's... Uh, but also, it doesn't allow you to... Um, a free trade agreement to ship goods indiscriminately if they're from outside, right? I mean, there are rules about... That's what negotiated. The pro rules of providence about that. It's meant to have a common front to the outside on that. But that you go back to what we were talking about earlier. That's one reason you need the technology, to know where something came from. Mm. Without that, none of this is, is going to work. Another factor we don't talk about, and in many conversations, you and I, we've talked a lot about it. In fact, we've advocated for it. How is the AFCTA going to effectively capture the informal sector in this country? Well, I think it's... it's and not in African a, countries. No, exactly. And I don't think it's just an AFCFTA issue. But, I mean, 65% of the economy in Nigeria is uh, informal. Uh, I was at an amazing event earlier this week um, that discussed the fact that 85% of school pupils in Lagos are in private schools. 85%. 85%. Many of them in unregistered schools. But you know, they're getting an education. Unregistered some of them, private schools. Right. And so then um, Lagos State's actually taken the view. They, they recognize this as an asset. This informal sector is an asset. But you still have the question, how do you bring... Uh, not necessarily private school to state school, but private school into a uh, registered, into more registered system. We need to bring down the barriers to coming into the formal system. So it's still too expensive. There's still too many regulations, hurdles. So we talk all the time in this country about uh, micro and small enterprises. 
uh, I won't even talk about medium ones, but those ones, you want to bring them into the formal sector. There has to be low cost, simple way that they can come into the more formal sector because there's, they're now going to incur costs, you know, VAT, some sort of filing. But if those barriers still remain too high, multiple taxation, they're not going to come into the formal system. And I, I think one challenge I'll put for the government here is I, th I think sometimes when, like Dr. Uh, Mule from the CBN was talking this morning, we talk about these transmission mechanisms as if they work the same way as in a developed nation. So you pull this uh, uh, interest rate lever and something happens in the economy. I think because we have such a large informal sector, that mechanism doesn't actually work. And unless you tackle how does the economy actually work with 65% of the informal economy and directly go after the question, why is so much of the economy in the informal sector? So now we, you know, we're all desperate at, the, at every level of government for more revenue. Mm -hmm. What's happened over the last few years, though, is we haven't been getting, the economy's not growing. And then the, this is where you get the formal sector laden with more and more multiple taxation. So what happens? The people in the informal sector look at the formal sector and they say, I want even less to go into the, to, into the formal sector. So I, I would like to see the federal government and the state governments actually tackle specifically this issue of how do we bring people into the informal economy, but we can't coerce them. We have to make it more advantageous to come from the informal to the formal economy. Mm. Let's look at some of the 2019 themes the PwC put out that would shape Nigeria. Uh, one of those was unemployment. Um, PwC is saying that unemployment rate you know, would uh, grow upward. Uh, but, you know, the minister in Nigeria for, um, uh, I think it was productivity, or labor labor productivity, productivity or, or the Minister for Investment that said, you know, there'll be 20 million jobs in the next four years. Uh, don't you think that that's doable? And what exactly did you mean by an upward review? Because we're talking about the AFCTA creating mm -hmm. employment. If Nigeria does sign finally, uh, don't you think that will take care of that worry by the PwC? Well, I think um, part of the issue, of course, is we mean and others putting it on the agenda. So now mm -hmm. I don't think everyone in the country, two years ago, we were not talking about unemployment or youth unemployment enough. Now we all kind of understand it. So Minister Nelema came out and said 20 million jobs. I think he knows exactly kind of what's, what's required to do that. And he identified, uh, I think, four sectors, uh, real estate, uh, agri, manufacturing, and maybe, maybe IT was the fourth. But, um, I mean, we've been consistent that the, that the problem is that there's been a lot of effort on, say, ease of doing business at one level. And Hebeck, Dr. Jamoke, Minister Anama, the vice president have really put an effort in. But what the country has not done is make any structural decisions. So we talk, you know, we've talked about the fuel subsidy, that's one. But there's many other structural decisions where it's hard to point to any sort of structural change. But So let me give one example here. We have said for almost three years now that the single most important industry for alleviating youth unemployment is real estate. Because when you build, we have a deficit of 17 million housing units. When you build uh, affordable housing, I don't mean subsidized, but a housing that is affordable at yeah. your income level, um, uh, you, you, know, you need all the, the local material is sourced for that. We're not importing for that level of housing. You have carpenters, plumbers, electricians, caterers come to the site to feed it. And when someone gets a house, over time, they want to furnish it. So mm -hmm. it drives, and again, they're not buying imported furniture. They're going to buy locally manufactured furniture. So it's really the biggest engine. And what we said is we want every sector to work. But if real estate doesn't work, the others cannot compensate for it. So then you ask, what's the structural issues in real estate? And it's very interesting because if you look at the National Bureau of Statistics numbers, real estate's done very, very poorly. It well, shrunk yeah. a number of, it yeah. grew a little more the last quarter and the formal real estate sector. But if you actually go out in Lagos, you see uh, quite, quite a lot of... Uh, if, it, and you know, we're trying to get to the bottom of this, but our view is that, is that actually there's such a demand for housing. Mm -hmm. Some people are prepared to kind of move ahead, both to build and then someone to buy, without all the I's and T's mm. crossed in terms of certificate of... Uh, of, uh, ownership, uh, ownership, ownership and property exactly, rights and things like that. Exactly. So, so that's very interesting. It tells you there's this huge pent-up demand. So then the question is, what can the federal and the state governments do? Because it's a joint issue with the Land Use Act and the role of the governors to, to turbocharge that. And so that's what we'd like to see. So even before we get to the AFCFTA, because I think that's a longer-term impact, mm -hmm. there are things that Nigeria and the states need to, need to, need to do to, to alleviate that. But, I mean, I think that... 
that the, the minister is, he's la he is laser focused on this issue, and I think he knows exactly what to do. But, I mean, we all know the political challenges in mm. Nigeria, in a complex place, bring in the whole political class is not easy. Let's just quickly talk about property rights and the FCT, because they go hand in hand. You talked about the land use act in 76, still there. You can do a lot with your land. Property rights, AFCTA, how can an average Nigerian manufacturer cope? Well, I mean, right now they can't, right? And, yeah. and it's, it's just, you know, we put up the barriers, the ownership of land, so then you, to, even to get a... And then, of course, are you going to invest in the land? I mean, we were talking a minute ago about residential housing, but yeah. it equally applies to any investment in the land, which includes upgrading it in terms of a, a, a industrial park yeah. or a factory. And people are reluctant to, to do that. So we're not getting the flow of investment on that. And you, you, know, you talk about other countries in Africa. I mean, Ghana got $3 billion of foreign direct investment last year. We only got $2 billion. Now, for mm. you know, our view is that Nigeria should be getting at least 10 times, uh, 10 times that. Mm -hmm. but, but without some of these structural barriers and property rights being secured, we're, we're, not, we're not getting there. And also the issue of debt capital. Because there's debt capital on that land a lot of people are not using. Right. So we've talked about it. We're actually finally going to put out our paper on... Uh, dead capital. Um, we're releasing it, I think, on June 17th. Um, so we've done the calculation, and I think the number, if it comes out differently, but I think the number is three, the minimum number is $300 billion um, dollars of dead capital in real estate in Nigeria. Um, mm -hmm. so, so basically, I mean, you take a simple example. Someone uh, has a plot of land. No one's challenging that they're there. They might have put a simple dwelling on it, but they now want to sell it to go move in with their sister and start a small business. That kind of normal capital allocation, entrepreneurial spirit that Nigerians have. Because of the fact that land is not usable as capital, that becomes impossible. So the person sits in the, in the piece of land, they haven't gone to move with their sister and started the business, and the whole economy loses. So you know, oftentimes we've talked to PwC about the need for foreign capital. And that's absolutely true. But actually, our need for foreign capital would come down a lot if we unlocked our own dead capital. And, and that's the best source. So we, I mean, it's, 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 I don't want to say it's um, an evil, but we want as little foreign capital as possible. To the extent that we can create capital internally, that's what we want to do. And you had Oscar, the DG of um, the Stock Exchange, uh, talking earlier. I mean, it's very critical to kind of create structures here to grow the capital markets, to unlock the pension funds that we have so they can be invested in product productive activities. I'm very quickly before we let you go. I mean, President Mohamed Buhari has been sworn in for a second term. We have the uh, central bank governor, Gov Godwin Mefele, also reappointed for a second term. Are we sending out the right signals to the markets, to uh, corporate nations? What are we saying? as Nigeria well, I at think, the moment. I, yeah, I mean, I think all of it, both within the country and outside the country, we're kind of waiting a little bit to see, see what happens. I think the big change from four years ago mm -hmm. is that we've come through these four years where uh, one of the accomplishments, accomplishments has not been the economy humming. I mean, you saw um, uh, on the commercial, one of the commercials, the federal government say we're targeting 6%. I mean, it may be PwC that caused that because we've been saying 6 to 8% for the past three or four years. I, I think it's sunk in that 2% is not uh, good enough. Mm. So I, I do think there's a step, step change in that. And of course, the press has been reporting that the, the President Buhari has been reflecting on all of mm. this. So mm. I think there's the potential to see um, uh, you know, some bigger changes. But, uh, but we're waiting right now to see the cabinet, what the, what the measure was. So I was with um, uh, Dr. Uh, Kayare Bukar, who's mm -hmm. very famous for many reasons, but was chairman of NESG, for yeah. example. Um, and he made the point that he, he thought a positive signal would be if half of the cabinet was technocrats. Okay, thank you so much. On that note, uh, that was bringing you to the end of the morning show today. I'm a Swell Moron. And I'm Rafaya Saini. Thank you for watching from my entire team here in Lagos. Enjoy the rest of your morning and, of course, the rest of your day. And have a wonderful weekend. Uh, goodbye.